Uh, Mr. Bloom, and to all our guests, again, we apologize for any inconvenience uh, for uh, what was an especially long vote series. The chair will now recognize uh, the vice chairman of the subcommittee, Dr. Gozar, the gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Bloom, does, uh, do you agree, um, or does the current law projections include a 30 percent cut in the provider payment rate scheduled to occur next year? The um, trustees yes. report. Um, How about yes or no? Uh, no, it does not. The uh, uh, trustees report projects current law, and current law would have a 30 percent cut in uh, 2012 absent congressional legislation. Hmm. Okay. Um, the chief actuary at CMS then says that many of the providers will find it difficult to remain in Medicare if pro pro provider payments are cut dramatically. I find that in Arizona already. So if we are making further cuts, we are not going to see a lot of providers or access to care, right? I think, I think what the chief actuary has said is that, that it is possible that Congress may repeal some of the savings provisions um, that are May repeal? Correct. So that is a, a big maybe, not a definitive? What the trustees' report has projected current law, and, and current law has uh, productivity uh, payment adjustments for hospital and other health care providers, really to incent more efficiency. Um, and so, what uh, the, the actuaries have, have projected a alternative scenario for uh, for future costs if if Congress were to repeal some of the changes, um, and also that if Congress were to provide a, a permanent fix to the SGR. Well, we didn't include the SGR into that fix, did we? Which fix? I'm sorry. I mean, for uh, the health care, the health care bill did not take into the SGR fix. Current law provides that in uh, January 1, 2012, that physician payments would be reduced um, by 30 percent or so. Uh, the and do you actually think that's going to go through? Uh, the President has called for a, a permanent fix to the SGR, one that's done in a fiscally responsible way. The administration is hopeful that the Congress will address the long-term SGR, um, but the President has said that it should be done in a, in kind of fiscally responsible way. His 2012 budget submission uh, provided a uh, paid-for two-year extension, um, but he has also said his very strong commitment uh, for, a, for a permanent uh, fix to the SGR. Well, I understand the commitment and, and trying to per perform the fix. Have you actually been on the ground? Because, um, you know, physicians are chasing their tail, so uh, a cut is in, improbable. Just because it just doesn't work that way in a, in a, in a physician's office. I have traveled uh, throughout the country over my time at CMS, and what I hear is uh, tremendous frustration from physicians about sort of the, you know, the current um, um, uncertainty to what physician payments will be in the future. The good news is that so far we're not seeing any access issues for beneficiaries nationwide. Um, but but if the 30 percent cut were to go into effect, that, that we'd have to be very worried about access to physician services. But we're already starting to see that. I'm from rural America, from rural Arizona, and and we're starting to see it already. Because once again, we're just chasing our tail because we're not getting paid, and we're hopefully getting down a road so that we get some compensation. And so there's no efficiency in that model whatsoever. And there's no efficiency in some of the, the clinics as well when we're talking about paying um, um, encounter fees um, just so that we have a single WIC mom coming five different weeks for one visit, not even seeing a physician. That's not called efficiency in my book. I think, I think um, what the Affordable Care Act provides CMS new tools and new, new payment authorities. And I think one of our challenges, but also our opportunities, is to change how we pay for physician services and other services to uh, promote greater care coordination, to promote uh, 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 you know, more efficiency in payments, to reward outcomes rather than just the volume of services. So one of the um, highest priorities that we have at CMS is to build the next generation of payment systems uh, to, uh, to ensure uh, more accountability, uh, greater quality outcomes. Um, but, but I agree with you, Congressman, we have to address the, uh, the uh, 30 percent shortfall that is scheduled to take effect. Yeah. Well, I am going to go back to this. Your testimony assumes, at least the numbers you are reporting to us, assumes that there is a physician 30 percent cut, right? The actuary's um, report this year um, assumes uh, that the 30 percent uh, cut will go into effect. That assumes current law. What the President has called for is a fiscally responsible permanent fix to the SGR. Um, he has proposed a two-year extension that is fully offset by other changes to the Medicare and Medicaid programs. So, so we agree uh, that we need to find a permanent solution 
to our, to our current physician shortfall, um, but at the same time we need to make sure that the Medicare program remains strong uh, for future uh, generations. Part of that uh, strategy is to ensure that we build the next generation of, of payment systems uh, to ensure that health care is more efficient, that it is more accountable, that, that, are, that it rewards care coordination, and through, through, through payment improvements, through delivery improvements, uh, we can save tremendous, tremendous amounts of money. Don't you feel, just real quick, Chairman, uh, don't you feel that not mentioning this 30 percent cut is misleading? Again, it depends how the 30 percent cut is implemented, and I can't speak to how a uh, Congress will, will change, that it could be done in a budget-neutral manner, that it could be done in a non-budget-neutral manner. Uh, what, I am, uh, what I can speak to is the projections to the trustees' report that has, that has projected uh, additional Medicare solvency, the Part A trust fund that doesn't include physician services, no matter what the SGR change is, the Part A trust fund will be solvent for eight more years. Well, that's, I, I have to interrupt, because that is contingency on, on having more jobs in this country. And if you look, last look, that didn't work. And I know that the hospitals bought into making, uh, agreed to certain cuts, and now those cuts are even greater. All I got to tell you is, is the hospitals back home in rural America are saying no way. So I, I think you uh, I need to redo your math. Thank you. Thank the gentleman from Arizona. The chair would now recognize the general lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I thank you for this hearing because it, I think it, 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 it um, allows us to get some uh, information on the record. Um, many would say that the present majority got here, uh, was, was able uh, to take over the House by the way they uh, characterized uh, what I think many would regard as the only uh, um, savings, substantial savings in Medicare in a long time. It was virtual demagoguery demagogy about uh, the Medicare Advantage plan. Now, a quarter of our seniors get Medicare Advantage. But the last time I heard, all seniors, like all men and women, are created equal, uh, except that we spent $14 billion, I believe the figure was, more on those who were involved in this private beneficiary plan and then got, shall we call it premium support, from the Congress, except that premium was the, was the, was the bulk of uh, what uh, uh, was, was $14 billion. Um, now, um, if they had stayed in traditional M Medicare, of course, um, they, the cost would have been le less, $14 billion less, to, to be exact. So isn't it the case that the Affordable uh, Care Act, by correcting this overpayment, in fact saved Medicare funds? Uh, for, for the first time that anyone has been able to do so in any, any large amount of funds? Uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, phases down uh, the uh, um, higher payments that are made to Medicare Advantage plans down to a level on average that, that will be closer to the traditional fee-for-service program. So you could still get it. Correct. But you couldn't get all those extras that, 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 that sent you way above what other Medicare patients were getting, uh, uh, seniors were getting. Sure. Uh, CMS began to phase in those, those payment reductions last year. Um, they will continue over the next several years. Um, contrary to predictions, more Medicare beneficiaries are going into the Medicare Advantage program. We expect that it will continue to grow over the next several years. So while we are phasing down payments, we are also um, increasing our oversight of the plans. We are, we are. Uh, uh, so people continue in their plans, or, or in that, that those who prefer private plans continued in it, even though they didn't get this this overpayment. And more are signing up every day. Uh, let me ask you about another uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, concerns. Um, when, the, um, when Part D was passed, we bemoaned the fact that it wasn't paid for. Uh, it, is, it is, in fact, the case that the uh, Affordable uh, Care Act was paid for. Is that not the case? 
uh, the Affordable Care Act included $500 billion in uh, uh, cuts to the Medicare program. Uh, while there were some savings provisions that were included within the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003, that it is correct that, that the Part D benefit was not, was not paid for. Uh, that, that, was, that was a lot not to be paid for. But uh, as we know, the trustees, um, um, I'm sorry, um, yes, the trustees uh, have to let us know when the general funds uh, are being tapped to pay for uh, Part D. Now, the figures I have show that 82 percent of the financing of Part D comes from general revenues and only 10 percent from beneficiary premiums. Um, uh, states make up 7 percent of the financing, according to the figures I have. Um, the Medicare trigger denoting you reach that 45 percent was almost immediately pulled. Um, Do you believe that lowering the Medicare D prescription drug spending uh, would reduce the chances of this, of triggering um, the general services, uh, the general revenue obligation? Sure. Um, the, the 45 percent trigger it is triggered um, when non-dedicated revenues um, are greater than 45 percent. Uh, the Part D benefit in its current structure is financed um, roughly 75 uh, percent um, in uh, um, uh, uh, beneficiaries pay 25 beneficiaries who are not. Uh, well, could, could I ask you now, in the Affordable Health Care Act, we, we, we close the donut hole over time. Now, how, how do we pay for that? And we say that was paid for. Uh, the Part D donut hole um, was. Uh, estimated to be about 16 to 20 billion dollars of uh, costs um, that, uh, that could be wrong. I'll have to get back to you with an accurate figure. Um, but the but the changes to close the donut hole were fully offset by, by other savings provisions within the Affordable Care Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the general lady from the District of Columbia. The chair would now recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. Mr. Murphy, I apologize. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Vermont is a beautiful place. <laughs> so is Connecticut. Uh, Mr. My, Bloom. My apologies. <laughs> Mr. Bloom, uh, thank you uh, very much for appearing today. I, I want to just uh, maybe extend the conversation that um, uh, Ms. Norton was having with you regarding uh, what has happened to Medicare Advantage. You talked about the fact that more, not less, people are signing up uh, since the Affordable Care Act has been passed. Can you talk a little bit about premiums um, for uh, seniors um, as it relates to premium increases prior to uh, the subsidies being uh, taken away? Sure. Um, uh, currently, that the average premium for those beneficiaries who are in the program are um, 6 to 7 percent lower than they were last year. So we are seeing an average decline of uh, premiums for beneficiaries that, that, that are still in the program. Um, average benefits have stayed the same, and, and more Medicare beneficiaries are signing up for the program relative to overall growth in the program overall. So payments are coming down, more beneficiaries are going into the program relative to last year, and average premiums are declining. You have a guess as to why premiums are coming down? Well, I think that uh, when the program is uh, when CMS is a tougher negotiator, last year we denied um, planned bids for the first time with new authorities that were provided to the Secretary to, to oversee the program. We are more actively managing the program. We are being much more um, stronger stewards of the program. And I think the lessons that I have taken is that when we have um, uh, enhanced our oversight, promoted competition, simplified beneficiary choices, held plans to the standards um, that are consistent with our goals and values, competition increases, premiums are lower, and, and beneficiaries are more satisfied and join uh, plans. The Affordable Care Act provides a tremendous new tool uh, to our oversight of the program. For the first time starting in 2012, we will be able to um, provide bonus payments to those plans that provide the greatest quality outcome 
becomes the greatest performance. So I think we have more tools than we have had in the past, but CMS has a stronger commitment to oversee the program. And, and when that happens, we get, get lower costs for taxpayers, lower premiums for beneficiaries, and stronger take up in the program. Well, I, I think that is really important information to have because uh, and I sat on the Energy and Commerce Committee and listened for a year and a half to opponents of health care reform uh, tell us two things, that if we were to remove the subsidies, the 13 to 15 percent subsidies above what traditional Medicare costs, uh, that um, plans would close up shop and seniors would no longer be able to have offered to them Medicare Advantage plans uh, and or costs would skyrocket. And exactly the opposite has happened. Um, since the Affordable Care Act has been passed, more people are signing up for Medicare Advantage and it is costing people less, which is frankly something you don't see almost anywhere else in the health care system, people's premiums uh, actually uh, declining. Um, and, and I think that is significant because as we are sitting here trying to assess how best to create benchmarks for our health care system for the Medicare program, the benchmark that we are looking at today uh, is one uh, regarding uh, the percentage of general revenues that go uh, into the program. But an equally important benchmark uh, is how much individual beneficiaries are paying out of their pocket. Uh, and the fact that the Affordable Care Act has meant that Medicare Advantage beneficiaries are paying less, that Part D beneficiaries are paying less, uh, that uh, Medicare beneficiaries who don't have to pay for preventative care are paying less, has just as much to do with whether or not we are achieving the ultimate goals of the program uh, as does a question of how much general revenues are being put uh, in to the program. And I think that is incredibly important as we talk about the current plan before us uh, by the Republicans to radically change the way that Medicare is structured. Because what we know is this, and CBO tells us, that the average beneficiary is going to uh, go from paying about 20 to 30 percent uh, of health care costs to somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 70 percent, that they are going to see their out-of-pocket expenses under the Ryan uh, Medicare privatization plan be tripled. Uh, over a 20-year window. Um, 65 and 66-year-olds would probably completely lose the ability to receive Medicare. Now, uh, that means something to uh, each individual beneficiary, but it also means something to the Federal Government. It also means that, uh, that those 65 and 66-year-olds leach somewhere else into the, leach out somewhere else into the system, and a lot of the costs um, that are borne by the beneficiary um, end up uh, resulting in people not receiving preventative care, getting sicker and costing us less later on. So uh, I would like to see us have benchmarks, but I think one of the benchmarks should also be how much money is coming out of the pocket of each individual beneficiary. And I think the Republican plan before us on this radical rewrite of Medicare um, will make tracking uh, those expenses even more important. I thank the Chair for the time, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Connecticut. And I apologize again for moving him without his uh, consent. Mr. Bloom, on behalf of all of us, thank you for thank you. Uh, sharing with us your perspective and for indulging us as we went uh, to vote. Um, we will, uh, I'm not even going to leave. I'm going to ask the second panel to come up. And uh, if uh, any of my colleagues need a break, they're welcome to take it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll go right into the second panel.
We want to welcome our second panel. Uh, I will introduce you from my left to right, your right to left. Dr. Charles Blayhouse III is public trustee of the Medicare and Social Security. Uh, Dr. Joseph uh, Antos, and if I mispronounce anyone's name, I apologize in advance, is the Wilson H. Taylor Scholar in Healthcare and Retirement Policy. Mr. James Cabretta is a fellow with the Ethics and Public Policy Center. And Dr. Paul uh, Vondewater is a senior fellow with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, I'm going to ask all four of our witnesses if they would please rise so I can administer the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and no nothing but the truth? May the record reflect all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Mr. Blayhouse, we will recognize you for your uh, five-minute uh, opening, and then we will go uh, from your right to left, my left to right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, uh, it is an honor to appear before you today to discuss the funding warning in the 2011 Trustees Report. Uh, my written testimony contains some basic background about Medicare financing, and in view of the limited time, I would just like to make a few uh, cursory summary comments in my oral remarks. First, Medicare has two trust funds. It has a hospital insurance trust fund, which we call Part A, and it has a supplementary medical insurance trust fund. Uh, and that's different, that's important to know because financial strains on each side of the program are manifested in different ways. On the Part A side, in the hospital insurance side, we as trustees make projections that are somewhat like the ones we make for Social Security. We, we project forward future program income, future program expenditures. We make a determination as to whether they are out of balance. Uh, we make a determination as to whether or not there is a date by which the trust fund will be exhausted. And naturally, there is great public and press interest each year in the trustees' annual projections for a date of depletion of the HI trust fund. On the SMI side, things operate somewhat differently. On that side, general revenues and rolling premiums are reestablished each year to match expected costs. So that side of the program doesn't go insolvent. Uh, when there are financial strains there, they are manifested in rising premiums, rising general revenue pressures. Now, if you look at Medicare as a whole, uh, it is bringing an in income from a, a lot of different sources. Uh, some of these sources are dedicated revenue sources, like payroll taxes, benefit taxes, premiums, state transfers. Uh, and some of the revenue sources are simply general revenue transfers from the remainder of the Federal budget uh, without a dedicated financing source. And the distinction between these different revenue sources is important uh, for the government's ability to finance Medicare. Whenever you increase revenues from a dedicated financing source, like payroll taxes or benefit taxes, you not only improve the status of the Medicare trust funds, but you improve the government's general ability to finance Medicare because you are also improving the unified budget balance. But if you increase general revenue contributions to Medicare, you can increase the balance of the Medicare trust funds, but that is at the expense of the general fund. It doesn't actually improve the government's net ability to, to finance Medicare. So it is important to keep an eye on uh, the size of those general revenue obligations. Now, under our projections, uh, the parts of Medicare that are funded predominantly by general, re by general revenues are going to grow substantially in the years to come. Uh, SMI was about 1.9 percent of GDP in 2010. We show that rising pretty sharply to about 3.4 percent of GDP by 2035, continuing to rise afterwards. And this is going to mean increased pressures on general revenues. Uh, we show general revenue requirements of 1.5 percent of GDP this year, gradually rising to over 3 percent of GDP by 2085. Now, as you noted in your opening statement, uh, the 2003 MMA directs the trustees to determine whether there is excess general revenue Medicare funding, and that means more than 45 percent of total Medicare outlays funded from general revenues in any of the first seven years of our projection period. And we did make such a finding for this fiscal year 2011. This is the sixth consecutive Medicare trustees report that has made such a finding. Uh, whenever that is done in two consecutive reports, we must issue a funding warning, as we did this year. Under our latest projections, we would be over 45 percent in fiscal years 2011 and 2012. Uh, we would need revenue increases of about $25 billion, benefit reductions of about $46 billion or some combination thereof to get that ratio down below 45 percent uh, for both 2011 and 2012. Now, under current law assumptions, which has been noted here, uh, assumes that we allow a 29 percent 
reduction in physician payments to go into effect next year, this ratio would drop below 45 percent in years 2013 through 2021 and then rise afterwards. By 2034, the ratio would hit 54 percent and stay at roughly that level through the remainder of the 75-year period. In sum, Mr. Chairman, the Medicare funding warning illuminates a part rather than the whole of the financing challenge facing Medicare. It basically represents a facet of the financing challenge that is, in a sense, complementary to the projections that we make for the solvency of the Part A trust fund. It looks at other aspects of program financing that the HI solvency calculation doesn't deal with. Uh, this year we found that the gap between Medicare's dedicated revenues and expenditures will exceed 45 percent of outlays in each of this year and next under current law, thereby triggering the Medicare funding warning pursuant to the MMA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Antos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member. Um, the um, trigger mechanism uh, known as the Medicare funding warning uh, is designed to reflect the combined financial condition of all parts of the Medicare program. Uh, it isn't a complete uh, 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 indicator of uh, everything that's going on with uh, Medicare financing, but it is an important uh, measure. It was intended to call attention to imbalances between Medicare spending and revenue specifically dedicated to fund the program. Uh, the uh, first funding warning uh, was declared by the trustees uh, in 2007 and has been declared by the trustees every year since then. President Bush responded in, the, in 2008, his only opportunity to respond. President Obama has not. Uh, I want to emphasize two points. Uh, first, for a given level of Medicare spending, the trigger directly addresses how much workers should pay for benefits for seniors. This is a difficult question that we as a society must answer. One can disagree about whether uh, 45 percent is the right level, but that does not invalidate its use. Second, uh, the Medicare trigger doesn't have teeth. As a result, the trigger has not directly led to legislation to slow the program's cost growth. Nonetheless, the trigger, like the trustees report itself, has raised attention to the fiscal crisis facing Medicare. And I might add, the trustees report has been equally unsuccessful in motivating a great deal of policy uh, response to uh, a, a program that is uh, in, in crisis. And the crisis is real. Despite White House claims that the new health reform law keeps Medicare strong and solvent, uh, the Affordable Care Act only modestly improved the, the program's fiscal outlook. According to the trustees, spending from the HI Trust Fund has exceeded revenue since 2008, and trust fund assets will be exhausted in 2024. SMI funding, that's Part B and Part D, uh, spending rather is uh, projected to moderate somewhat from past trends, uh, but the drain on the Treasury remains extremely high. In fact, those estimates are optimistic. They incorporate net Medicare savings from uh, the Affordable Care Act of $575 billion through 2019 and, of course, much more beyond that, primarily through reductions in payments to providers. These are reductions that the Medicare's chief actuary considers unrealistic. The estimates also assume that the Medicare payments to physicians will be cut in unprecedented 30 percent in January 2012. Neither assumption is plausible. Even the trustees state that the actual, uh, this is a quote, the actual future costs for Medicare are likely to exceed those shown by the current law projections. Uh, in fact, the uh, Actuary's Office uh, put out a supplementary re report to the trustees' report, and that report estimates much higher levels of Medicare spending, assuming that Congress uh, uh, rescinds the physician payment cut and rescinds partially uh, the other um, uh, Affordable Care Act reductions after 2021. Uh, they are not assuming that all of those cuts go away. They are assuming that some of them uh, are moderated. Um, the, uh, according to that analysis, uh, total Medicare spending will be 8 percent higher than the official estimate in 2020 and 14 percent higher in 2030, with spending growth continuing to accelerate beyond that point. That translates into trillions of dollars of additional general tax revenue that will be needed by Medicare over the next 75 years unless responsible policies are adopted to reduce program costs. As we have seen, the President and Congress can ignore 
uh, a Medicare trigger with impunity. That is business as usual in Washington. But neither the President nor Congress actually need the trigger to advance reasonable policy. And that is the point. Uh, uh, the, the President sends a budget to Congress every year. That budget should contain provisions that set Medicare on a sustainable fiscal path, not just for a year or two, but more permanently. Congress also doesn't have to wait for the President to act. The importance of this issue cannot be overstated. Decisions about Medicare financing, whether by conscious policy or by default, will determine the fate of a program that millions of seniors depend on. Those decisions will also shape the limits on Federal support for society's other pr priorities. Rapid growth in Medicare spending is a major contributor to the Nation's debt crisis. Failure to adopt structural reforms to promote greater efficiencies in delivering health care and higher values for a medical, Medicare dollar will be disastrous. The Medicare trigger could be a tool to encourage policymakers to do what they must do, but only if it is taken seriously. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cabretta. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Davis, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to participate, participate in this very important hearing. Uh, in the short time available, I want to focus my comments on the reason the trigger was proposed in the first place by, and adopted by Congress and why a credible reform of Medicare is so important. Uh, the Medicare program, as we just heard, is financed in ways that are not often well understood. Part of the program, as Dr. Blahouse said, is financed like Social Security, uh, but a big part of the program is not. Uh, for uh, Parts D and B of the program, uh, the beneficiaries pay premiums for a portion of the cost, but a large part is financed directly out of the general fund of the Treasury. These general fund payments to Medicare are not trivial. As I show in, in Chart 1 in my prepared testimony, the present value of these payments, as estimated by the Medicare trustees, is expected to ex exceed $21 trillion over the long-range projection period. Financing Part B and D in this manner can be deceptive in terms of the burden on taxpayers. Officially, these parts of Medicare are always solvent. The trust fund that pays these benefits is never expected to ever be depleted because it, by definition, has always got money from the general fund to cover its costs. But just because the trust funds appear to be solvent on paper does not mean that there is no cost to this open-ended tap on the Treasury. The money must come from somewhere. Uh, when Part B and D costs rise, the general fund is tapped for more funding. It just means the Federal budget goes deeper into deficit, thus for forcing more borrowing and debt. One way to look at the burden of the general fund financing of Medicare places on the rest of the budget is to look at the amount of, financing, of this financing relative to the personal and corporate income taxes. In my prepared testimony, I show in Chart 2 that as recently as 1990, the general fund contribution to Medicare Part B took up only 5.9 percent of total personal and corporate income tax collections. By 2020, with Part D now part of the program, that figure had risen to 19.2 percent, so one out of every five dollars uh, coming into the Treasury in personal and corporate income taxes goes as a payment to the Medicare program. By 2050, it is getting closer to about one, one out of every four dollars. And this is a very optimistic scenario. This is based on the official Medicare trustees' projections under current law, but that is highly unlikely to occur, as the actuaries themselves have stated repeatedly. Uh, in the uh, new health care law, uh, there is a very broad and deep reduction in the uh, provider payment rates, uh, whether it is called the productivity uh, uh, adjustment. Um, this is going to hit uh, hospital and other institutional providers of care every year in perpetuity. And the actuaries assume essentially that it won't happen because the consequence would be that many hospitals would stop seeing Medicare patients eventually. It would drive Medicare payments down to those of Medicaid and below and reach, uh, at, at, at some point in the not too distant future, 50 percent of what private insurers have to pay to access the hospital coverage. So the actuaries have produced an alternative scenario to say what is it going to look like if those kinds of cuts don't go into a place and the physician cut of 30 percent doesn't begin in next, next year. The result of that is shown in Chart 3 in my prepared testimony, and the effect is that over the long run, uh, total Medicare spending is essentially unchanged from where it was prior to enactment of the health law. In uh, 2080, it, uh, total Medicare spending would exceed 10 percent of GDP by that point in time, uh, which is well above the 4 percent it is now and certainly well above the 1 or 2 percent it was when the program was first enacted. Now, the Medicare trigger was enacted to bring into the policy debate a broader view of Medicare's financing beyond the misleading picture of permanent solvency for Parts B and D. 
Um, what's needed, though, at this point is, uh, as Joe indicated, the will to actually enact a structural reform of the program. And here I'd just like to conclude by pointing out that um, the, uh, there seems to be some agreement that Medicare is key to slowing uh, costs throughout the entire health system. As uh, Mr. Bloom testified, that they, they, their view of the administration is that they need to change how Medicare operates with things like the, afford, uh, the accountable care organizations and bundled payments and other payment reforms. It is my judgment that those uh, proposals will not get very far because of the burdens of politics and other things that will stand in the way. Uh, what I think is more promising is actually a reform like the Part D program has in the Medicare. It is true that it has driven up the general fund contribution to the program, but it is built around competition and consumer choice. And the effect of that has been since 2006 through, two, through 2010, the average annual per capita growth in costs has been just 1.2 percent because the consumers have a very strong incentive to go with low cost, high value plans, and that has worked. Uh, it is my judgment that we should. Uh, pursue Medicare reform in a broader way along those lines. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Von der Water. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Davis, I appreciate the invitation to appear before you today. Although Medicare faces significant financing challenges, claims by some policymakers that the program is facing bankruptcy are highly misleading. The 2011 report of the Medicare trustees shows little change from last year's report. Because the trustees now foresee a slower recovery, they estimate that Medicare's hospital insurance trust fund will be depleted in 2024, five years sooner than they estimated last year. Even at the point of depletion, however, payroll taxes and other revenues will still be sufficient to pay 90 percent of HI costs. HI will not be completely lacking in resources, nor does it face going out of business. And the 2024 date does not apply to Medicare's Supplementary Medical Insurance Trust Fund. SMI is always adequately financed because beneficiary premiums and general revenue contributions are set annually to cover expected costs for the coming year. By design, SMI cannot run out of money. The trustees' near-term projections are broadly in line with those they have issued in the past. Since 1990, changes in the law, the economy, and other factors have moved the projected year of HI insolvency as close as four years and as far as 28 years away. Trustees' reports, in fact, have been projecting insolvency for four decades, but Medicare benefits have always been paid because Congress has taken steps to make sure that they are. The rapid evolution of the health care system has required frequent adjustments to Medicare as it has to private health insurance, and that pattern is certain to continue. Although the trustees again project that 45 percent or more of Medicare's financing will come from general revenues within six years, this finding bears no relation whatever to Medicare solvency. The 45 percent figure is an arbitrary benchmark that is completely unrelated to the financial health of the program. By its very design, Medicare is supposed to be financed in large part with general revenues. That at least 45 percent of Medicare will be financed with general revenue is no more a problem than that 100 percent of defense, education, and most other Federal programs will also be financed with general revenues. Last year's health reform legislation significantly improved Medicare's long-term cost outlook. If health care were repealed, the Medicare actuary has estimated that HI's insolvency date would be moved up eight years to 2016. And without health reform, HI's long-term shortfall would increase from 0.79 percent of payroll to 3.89 percent. These projections underscore the importance of successfully implementing the cost containment provisions in the Affordable Care Act. In contrast, phasing out traditional Medicare and replacing it with private health insurance, as the House passed budget resolution would do, would represent a big step in the wrong direction. It would increase total health care spending attributable to Medicare beneficiaries by upwards of 40 percent, and it would reduce the Federal Government's contribution to cover those costs. As a result, the House plan would massively shift costs to elderly and disabled beneficiaries. 
According to CBO, the average 65-year-old beneficiary's out-of-pocket spending would more than double, from about $6,000 a year to over $12,000 in 2022. Health reform envisions that Medicare will continue to lead the way in efforts to slow health care costs while improving the quality of care. By eliminating traditional Medicare, the House passed plan would discard the opportunity to use the program to promote cost reduction throughout the health care system. Americans should not be driven into adopting such a radical proposal by misleading claims that Medicare is on the verge of bankruptcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Blayhouse, uh, what, in your judgment, is the single best uh, policy that you could recommend uh, in order to improve Medicare solvency? Um, I have to be a little bit careful in answering that question. Obviously, as a trustee, uh, we don't have an official view, and I'm not uh, speaking for the other trustees. Uh, I, I would just make a couple of comments. One is, um, you know, certainly uh, there is a, a robust debate about how we can get more savings uh, in order to achieve actuarial balance in Medicare. We have a shortfall in Medicare. There's competing ideas on how to resolve the remaining shortfall. Before uh, you finish that, let me, because I may be making an assumption that you disagree with, do you agree with Dr. Von der Water that all of this is, is just worrying about nothing and that everything is going to be fine and we can continue to fund it from the general fund and it's no big deal? Uh, I don't agree that it's no big deal. I think we have a very substantial financing challenge in, uh, in Medicare, a, a sizable problem remaining to solve. Uh, I'm very concerned about it. Uh, all right. Go on with your uh, solution. Well, I, I would say that the, one of the things that's difficult is getting savings uh, from a program that people are dependent upon. Uh, and this is one of the things that causes people on both sides of the aisle to have disagreements. How can we get savings, uh, which we need, from the Medicare program without sacrificing beneficiary access to care? Uh, what I can say is that it's easier to hold down spending growth where people have not yet become dependent on a program. And I, if, I, if I could just give one piece of advice uh, personally, I would say do what can be done to slow down or scale back the spending increases in last year's health care reform law. Uh, basically, um, to the extent that we show an improvement in Medicare financing under that law, it's because of the Medicare provisions alone understood in isolation. But that law contained other provisions that expended a great deal of that uh, projected savings in Medicare, about 63 percent of it, according to CBO. Uh, to the extent that we expend that savings in Medicare on a new program, uh, we are undercutting the government's ability to make good on that, uh, those increased funding obligations to Medicare. So uh, I think my short answer would be do whatever can be done to uh, scale back the projected spending increases uh, outside of Medicare from last year's health care law. Well, that leads uh, nicely, I think, to my next question for you, uh, Dr. Antosh. Um, do you agree with the administration that the trigger mechanism is just a suggestion um, or an advisory idea, or do you believe that it is a legal requirement that they submit a plan? It is a law. That is what I thought, too. Um, <laughs> do you think that, the, uh, that Obamacare complies with that? requirement of the law? Well, it certainly does not uh, comply with the technical specifications of the law. The law clearly states that in response to the funding warning, the President is to uh, uh, send to uh, Congress his proposal within two weeks uh, of his budget. Now, I think it may be a little unclear, um, at least in the abstract, uh, if the President's budget, in fact, addressed this problem, whether that was a sufficient response. However, uh, in my opinion, uh, the President's budget at this time did not address the problem. Uh, Mr. Cabretta, uh, I thought about patenting uh, or getting a trademark on Paul Ryan's name so I could be paid every time it is mentioned in a committee hearing in Washington. Um, I haven't yet. Um, a lot of criticism about Representative Ryan's plan. Uh, the other plan, near as I can tell, is just to continue to raise the debt ceiling um, as often as we can. What are your thoughts on his plan, and do you have a better idea? Pardon me. I don't have a better idea. I think his plan is uh, uh, really very much the direction we need to head. 
Uh, I'd say a couple of things about some of the, the criticisms that are made about it. Uh, first is there's often reference to a CBO analysis of what the Ryan plan would do in 2022. A couple of things about that. First, uh, it assumes that the payment rate reductions that occur in Medicare through Obamacare are going to be in place all the way to 2022. So in a sense, it creates, uh, it says that we're going to impose very deep price reductions in what Medicare pays for services, price reductions that would bring Medicare's rates down below Medicaid by the end of the decade, and assumes those will be in effect in 2022, and that Medicare beneficiaries will still have access to care in 2022 at the rates they do today, highly unlikely that that will occur. So I think one assumption is just false, that you can have you know, you could pay as low as you want in Medicare with no consequence whatsoever on quality. I think that's a false assumption that's buried in those CBO numbers. The second thing that it doesn't do is that it, it doesn't take into account any effect from competition. And Dr. Elmendorf testified at the House Budget Committee oh, a week or so ago, 10 days ago, and said as much to Chairman Ryan that that's a gap in their toolbox, that they don't estimate the effects of competition on what it will do to premiums in the future, and so they have no uh, the whole point of the Ryan proposal is to bring some discipline to the Medicare program, not to increase costs on seniors, but actually increase value so that they can get a better deal, much like we did in the Part D program. So I, I generally reject the notion that the Ryan plan is actually going to be worse for seniors. The whole point of it is actually to make it better for seniors without the problems that come from price controls. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Day. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, The Republican federal budget proposal for fiscal year 2012, widely known as the Ryan Plan, was passed by a party line vote in the House of Representatives on April 15, 2011. The Ryan Plan would end Medicare as it exists today, take away all federal health benefits from 65 and 66-year-olds, and give 67-year-olds and older a voucher that would pay a smaller and smaller share of their health care cost. According to the Congressional Budget Office's long-term analysis of the Ryan Plan, this proposal would result in substantially higher out-of-pocket costs for seniors. CBO found that they would be paying 68 percent of their health care costs, more than double what they pay now under traditional Medicare. This massive shift in costs from the government on to individuals would cause many seniors to forego health care altogether. Those that could would sign up for welfare programs. Dr. Blayhouse Chairman Ryan represents this radical transformation he is leading as, and I am quoting, preserving and protecting Medicare. But any student of history could know that Republicans opposed the creation of Medicare in the 1960s and have sought to dismantle it since then. Dr. Blayhouse, are you familiar with this quote from former Republican National Committee Chairman Haley Barber, who extolled the 1995 Trustees Report as manna from heaven in an effort to politicize Medicare and justify then-Speaker Gingrich's contract with America plan to cut Medicare spending by 14 percent to provide tax cuts for the rich. Uh, I was not familiar with that quote, sir, no. Okay. If you heard such a quote, um, would you um, agree with it, have any concerns about it, or have a different position and a different opinion? Well, certainly speaking as someone who uh, uh, I feel very honored to have uh, become a trustee last year. It would certainly be my hope that the trustees' reports uh, be received in a spirit so that they inspire uh, changes to make financial corrections to preserve the financial soundness of the Medicare program. Uh, the, the purpose of the trustees' report is to acquaint 
Congress and the public with the finances of Medicare uh, to permit the program to be as strong as possible? Um, Mr. Van Duwata, can I ask you, under the Ryan proposal, the Congressional Budget Office determined that the gradually increasing number of Medicare beneficiaries participating in the new premium support program would bear a much larger share of their health care costs than they would under the traditional program. That greater burden would require them to reduce their use of health care services, spend less on other goods and services, or save more in advance of retirement than they would under current law. At the same time, the proposal analyzed by CBO would leave in place provisions restraining payments to many providers under the traditional Medicare program. Under this scenario, where, where are seniors who are living on a fixed income supposed to get the additional money they need to obtain health care and take care of their basic needs like food, shelter, and clothing? And won't all of this put an even bigger burden on seniors themselves and their children who might be helping out? Yes, I think that is correct, Mr. Davis. As you or another one of the members, I believe, has already uh, cited that the Congressional Budget Office analysis of the uh, budget resolution plan would roughly double the expected out-of-pocket costs for a typical 65-year-old in the first year from about $6,000 to over $12,000 a year. And uh, given the uh, uh, average income of a 65-year-old, uh, that uh, increase would be, uh, uh, would be a significant burden. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. The Chair would now uh, recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I thank uh, the panel for being here with us today. Um, Representative Davis, is, uh, as I will, uh, spent some time talking about uh, the Ryan budget, the budget that passed through the House of Representatives. And uh, I think it is appropriate because what the subject of today's hearing is really about is um, who has uh, the burden of making proposals uh, to try to reform our Medicare program uh, going forward. And uh, that is a really important topic for us to be talking about. And we have uh, one very clearly articulated plan before Congress right now, and that is the Republican budget, which um, dramatically changes uh, the uh, Medicare program and admittedly certainly takes cost out of it, but takes cost out of it by shifting the burden on to individuals, tripling the amount of out-of-pocket costs for senior citizens, for example. But um, one of the other things it, it does, and uh, Dr. Vanderwater, I will ask you a question about this um, because I know you have spent some time looking at it. What it also does is it removes uh, 65 and 66-year-olds from eligibility for the program. And, you know, maybe this doesn't, you know, seem like such a, a big deal. It is sort of built in this mythology that people are, uh, that people are living longer. It is not necessarily that over the last few years uh, people are living longer. It is that less infants are, are, are dying. And uh, so you still have people retiring, leaving work at about the same uh, age and needing benefits. Uh, Medicare was conceived in part because those people who were 65 and 66 just didn't have a private market, didn't have a place to go to that could adequ adequately insure someone that is likely going to be more sick. And the reality is, is that uh, a lot of those people um, who are 65 and 66 uh, and who don't will not now qualify for Medicare are going to receive their care from somewhere else, that the, the cost is going to shift to somewhere else in the system. And I guess I wanted to ask that question to you, Dr. Vanderwater. What, what happens as you move um, millions of 65- and 66-year-olds off of Medicare? Um, there seems to be an idea that the government won't bear that cost. Um, but in reality, we are likely to shift a lot of that health care cost just onto the government dime somewhere else. Um, could you speak a little bit about how cost, cost shifting for individuals who are removed from the Medicare rolls uh, occurs? Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Murphy. Um, I might say that the uh, proposal to increase or discussion of uh, increasing the Medicare eligibility age to 67 
is um, problematic, but at least I think is, uh, uh, you know, can sensibly be discussed if one is assuming that the uh, Affordable Care Act goes into effect. Because with the Affordable Care Act, at the very least, uh, 65 and 66-year-olds would have an a guaranteed alternative source of coverage. Many beneficiaries would have to pay considerably more, but they wouldn't be uh, completely shut out of the market. But as we know, under the current uh, arrangement, without the uh, uh, provisions of the Affordable Care Act, uh, many people in their 60s find that uh, insurance is either unavailable or completely, uh, completely unaffordable. Uh, and uh, uh, so the result is exactly as you say. If the eligibility age were increased, some of the people in those the 65 to 66-year-old uh, bracket would go without insurance. To some extent, they would cut back on uh, care if they couldn't afford it. To some extent, they would pay for it out of pocket. And to some extent, it would end up being paid for through um, uh, emergency room visits and uh, 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 some people, of course, would be poor and would end up uh, uh, on Medicaid, uh, so it would be shifted in a variety of fashions. And, and I think that your, your point is a good one, which is that um, though, though I don't support moving the retirement age up to 67, um, we did hear for a period of time uh, in this Congress a mantra of repeal and replace, um, which was, I think, a an effort at least on behalf of those who opposed the um, health care bill that was passed by this Congress to, to recognize that we needed something else in its place. We don't have that any longer. We just have repeal. Uh, and those that will be most exposed, as you mentioned, are those who are right on the cusp of uh, Medicare eligibility. In fact, right now, even at, uh, with the eligibility at 65, uh, the people who are most likely to go without insurance if they lose their job are people who are in the 55 to 65 uh, age bracket. Um, and so I, I do think that it's important to recognize how fragile uh, the world is today for people right on the edge of Medicare eligibility and how incredibly um, increasingly fragile it becomes if you partner these drastic changes in the Ryan budget to Medicare with a full repeal of uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I see my time is up. I yield back. I thank the gentleman and all of us thank our four witnesses, not only for lending us your perspective, your insight, your expertise, but also for accommodating a long vote series. I know your time is just as valuable as ours, if not more so. So I, we appreciate uh, your uh, courtesy and, um, and, and thank you again for your presence today. Uh, hearing is adjourned.